it's sometimes suggested that certain high-profile atheists or agnostics have regretted the error of their philosophical convic convictions and at the end of their life or lives, while upon their deathbed, they have placed saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've heard some stories like that. Now, while I do not have the capacity within myself for perfect omniscient analysis, and while I do think those type of conversions have undoubtedly happened throughout the course of history, I am nonetheless skeptical when I hear those kind of testimonies because so often the story behind the story proves that the supposed conversion report was actually fallacious. Take, for instance, the supposed conversion story of Charles Darwin. Perhaps you've heard that Charles Darwin was said to have placed faith in Jesus Christ in his dying moments, acknowledging that his theory of evolution was both untenable and untrue. And while I do believe that Darwin's theory of evolution is just that, both untenable and untrue, I do not believe that the evidence supports that he believed that, even at the end of his life. In an article entitled, Darwin's Deathbed Conversion, a Legend, question mark, Dr. Tommy Mitchell shares how the early reports of conversion, along with the interactions that are said to have led to that conversion, are not supported at all within the 14,000 pieces of correspondence that is still available, basically letters that were written to and from Charles Darwin. Furthermore, the story that originated from Elizabeth Cotton, you may not know who she is, she went by the um, name as well, aka you could say Lady Hope, which wasn't like her superhero name or anything like that. She actually just married a man whose name was Sir James Hope. And she's the one who had sparked a story, had shared a report, not in England, but I believe in the States, speaking about a visit that she had with Darwin prior to his death. And that report, when examined, at least the way Dr. Mitchell presents it, the details of that report are untenable. Mitchell shows how there are many consistencies in the text of her report. Furthermore, Darwin's son, for instance, Francis, was recorded as saying, quote, he, it's Darwin, could not have become openly and enthusiastically Christian without the knowledge of his family, and no such change occurred. And then a later letter from Francis, along with a letter from Darwin's daughter, Henrietta, reaffirmed the same thing. That although perhaps this woman, Lady Hope, Elizabeth Cotton, did visit Darwin some time before he died, there's no evidence to support the fact that, or to support the claim that he recanted his views and or placed saving faith in Jesus on his deathbed. Now, some people draw the erroneous conclusion that if a person is on the precipice of eternity, that they undoubtedly will turn to thoughts of God and Christ and the forgiveness of sins. And I just want to tell you that's not true. I can remember visiting someone in the hospital, and while I was there, there was an older man who was across from us. I had a conversation with him before what I'm about to tell you happened. While I was visiting someone else, this older man... He gets a report from the doctors telling him there's nothing more that they could do for him. I happen to be in the room when he gets that report. And some of the family members asked some questions and they basically reiterated, there's nothing left that we can do for you. As the doctors leave, a little bit after that, I start talking with the man again about the report that he heard. And then I spoke to him about Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. And I shared with him the gospel. And this older man told me, he looked me square in the eye and he said, I haven't placed faith in Jesus Christ all my life and you think I'm going to do that now? I'd be such a hypocrite if I did that. And I pleaded with him and I said, you would not be a hypocrite. You would give God more glory than you could imagine. He shrugged it off. Didn't want to hear it. Receiving word of a death sentence did not provoke in that man a change of thinking. And if you could be reminded of that, 
And if you can be reminded of text in Scripture, like in, for instance, Revelation 9, when men are depicted having survived the plagues that are depicted in that chapter, but nonetheless, even though they are on the brink of death, have staring death face to face, have these plagues assaulting them, nonetheless, we're told towards the end of the chapter, they did not repent of their sorceries, did not repent of their blasphemies, they didn't repent of their sexual immoralities, they did not repent, even though they were face to face with the prospect of impending death. If you could be reminded of that, it'll help you understand that what we're studying this morning is indeed miraculous. What we're studying this morning is, if you will, both the rule and the exception about men and what they will think about in the days leading up to their death. There are in our text two men. One, an impenitent thief. And the other, a penitent thief. Two men, both of whom were nearing the end of life, both of whom were guilty, both in the eyes of men and in the eyes of God, both of whom had the Savior near to them, but the two men had contrasting eternal destinies that were as stark in contrast as could be. We begin with seeing the rule, what can most be expected of men at some level, in some way, shape, or form even at the prospect of their death matching the prospect of their behavior in life. We begin in Luke 23, verse 39, where we read, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. So, our text begins, One of the criminals who were hanged essentially joined in the blasphemy of the passers-by. Remember, we saw the passers-by overtly blaspheming, Matthew 27, 39, and 40. He joined in the blasphemy of the religious leaders, Luke 23, 35, and he joined in the blasphemy of the Roman soldiers, verses 36 and 37. Now, I want you to note something here. Just think this is interesting. It's good for you to know. Concerning the word hanged, here is an example why, when I referenced the Talmud a couple of weeks ago, that says that Yeshu, speaking of Yeshua, speaking of Jesus, was hanged, that that phraseology, that term hanged, was a euphemism for crucified. You have even a biblical basis to see that. I mean, these men who were on either side of Jesus, they were clearly hanged upon a cross. They were crucified. Matthew's Gospel makes that clear. Matthew 27, 38, and verse 34. But Luke could use the word hanged Because it was another way of describing the same thing. Now what's interesting to note is that although in our text one criminal is blaspheming Jesus, shortly before this, shortly before what we're reading in Luke 23, 39, both criminals were blaspheming Jesus. If we were to look, for example, in Matthew 27, 44, we're told, quote, even those who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. The same thing being, verse 42, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Second half of verse 42, if he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will trust in him. The same thing being, verse 43, he trusted in God, let God deliver him now if he will have him for he said, I am the son of God. So both criminals were doing that. Mark's gospel, for instance, Mark 15, 32, says even those who were crucified with him reviled him. So not too long before this moment in Luke 23, 39, both criminals were blaspheming, challenging, mocking, and reviling Jesus Christ. Both were. But right here, the one of them is joining in with the surrounding crowd and is challenging Jesus saying, if you are the Christ, or as some of your translations might say, possibly in the form of a question, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now, at the risk of stating the obvious, I'm going to state it nonetheless. This man did not want salvation from sin. He wanted what many people want and only want, salvation from suffering. If you only see Jesus as a kind of divine Advil that you can pop in times of suffering, then you haven't seen the real Jesus And the prospect of a worse suffering, more than you could even imagine, is on the horizon unless you see that Jesus came to most ultimately deliver you, not from temporal suffering. That will come in the ultimate sense. Ultimately, that will come. 
but most immediately, and I would even say most ultimately, to deliver you from the penalty of your sins. To deliver you from the penalty of your sins. So this man says, save yourself and save us if you are the Christ. And again, as we've stated before, I want to state two things. It was by not saving himself that he was saving others. And the second thing I want to remind us about is that he, because he was the Christ, he couldn't save himself. I mean, he could have if he wanted to, if it was the divine plan, but it wasn't the divine plan. From before the foundation of the world, the divine plan was that he was going to suffer and that he wouldn't save himself. Isaiah 53, verse 7, it was appointed that Jesus would be a lamb led to the slaughter. Isaiah 53, verse 8, about 600 years before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it was appointed that he would be cut off from the land of the living. Verse 9, it was appointed, prophesied, that he would make his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death. It was appointed that he would pour out his soul to death. Isaiah 53, 12, it's because he was the Christ that he wouldn't save himself. So as to fulfill divine prophecy, they, like the others, thought that to be the Christ, Jesus would have to escape death, not realizing that being the Christ, he had to experience death and subsequently conquer death. So here the thief, who was in the same physically precarious situation as Jesus, called upon Jesus, not only to save himself, but this is, you know, he's looking out for his friend, to save not only himself, but to save his other friend, save us. So he's looking out for his perceivably partner in crime. He was looking out for his partner in thievery and blasphemy, but perhaps to his surprise, the other criminal wouldn't have it. Verse 40 reads, But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And he says more, but we'll stop there for a moment. This is startling. Doubtless this was startling for the other criminal. He probably expected, the one who was blaspheming Jesus, probably expected some sort of blasphemous reinforcements from the one who had been his partner in crime and cursing. But instead what he gets is, chided and censored. Amazing. Something had changed. There were two impenitent thieves on the cross, but now there appears to only be one. What happened? What happened that all of a sudden, when there were two thieves that were impenitent, all of a sudden now there'd only be one? What happened? Well, Jesus described it this way, using the imagery of wind. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. John chapter 3, verse 8. The penitent thief experienced the sovereign, undeserved grace of regeneration. He received the new birth. A new birth that according to Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 6, the flesh can't produce it. The flesh can't muster it up. It's a result of the sovereign will of God. The wind blows where it wishes. That's why Jesus didn't explain to Nicodemus when Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again? Jesus didn't say, well, you're going to pray this prayer. If you pray this prayer, then as a result of you praying that prayer, what's going to happen is you are going to cause yourself to be born again. You will give yourself new birth. No, you didn't give yourself birth in the natural sense, and you don't give yourself birth in the spiritual sense. The flesh profits nothing, Jesus says. But the Spirit gives life. And new birth is like the wind. You hear the sound of it and you don't know where it's come from and you don't know where it's going. It's the sovereign work of God. The thief, the penitent one, did not give himself new birth. He received it from the Holy Spirit. As Jesus said, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. John 6.37 In this man's case, the manifestation of his election and the granting of spiritual life happened to be at the end of his temporal life. 
But that's what happened. And now, even in his opening question, we're already beginning to see some of the evidences that the Holy Spirit had sovereignly, undeservedly opened this man's eyes to who Jesus was and granted him the grace of repentance. We'll see in this verse at least two evidences. The first one I want to show you is the evidence of fear. He asked the other criminal, Do you not even fear God, seeing as you are under the same condemnation? Now, given the fact that this man had been blaspheming Jesus not too long before, suggests to me that he had experienced a fear that he previously had not known. A fear that he had previously been without. So he asks this man essentially this question, Given the fact that you are on the brink of death, that you're under the same condemnation, i.e. execution to death, do you really think that you're not going to suffer consequences for your sin and for this blasphemy and this reviling? That's essentially what he's saying to this man. As somebody who had God graciously open his eyes, the fear of God came upon him, and now there's a sense of shock when he looks at a man who does not fear God even though he's on the brink of death. And it's at this point that we would do well to be reminded of the natural state of fallen man. According to Romans chapter 3, verse 16, verse 18, which in part quotes Psalm 36, verse 1, fallen man can be described in part like this. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And most explicitly, there is no saving, appropriate, reverent kind of fear, the kind that leads to repentance. Now, in the majority of my evangelistic conversations with people throughout the years, where I've asked the question, as you've heard before, not my own question, one that I had heard from um, Way of the Master being one of the places, but I know it dates back even beyond that. If you were to die tonight and you stood before God, And he said to you, why should I let you into my kingdom? He won't say that. But if he did say that to you, what would you say? Most of the time, I've heard people say responses like this. I'm a good person. And people usually aren't in that moment when they're saying I'm a good person. They're usually not trembling. They're usually not nervous. They usually have a kind of peace about them. You just asked me a question about death. You told me if I stand before God and He asks me why should I let you into the kingdom, they're usually not trembling at the prospect of standing before a holy God. They're usually kind of, that's not everybody, I'm just talking from my own sampling, my own experience, they're usually pretty calm, cool, and collected. No, me and God are good. I talk to Him. I talk to God all the time. I know about Jesus. It's fine. It's fine. By nature, there's no fear of God before the eyes of man because we have this tendency to exalt our own righteousness and to lower God's holiness. So typically, you can expect to see no fear of God before men's eyes because fallen man sees himself as good with God as opposed to how the scripture defines fallen man at enmity with God, with the wrath of God abiding, resting upon those who do not believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. But when the spirit of Yahweh comes upon a person... The one who is identified among other things in Isaiah 11 verse 2 as the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of Yahweh. He begets the holy fear that is the very beginning of wisdom. So that a person who would say, oh, I'm good with God. All of a sudden when the Holy Spirit opens their eyes, they say, no, I'm not good with God. I have sinned against the holy God. And rather than saying, I'm okay with God, they say something like the publican said. They say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the reality of life in this world that we have sinned against the holy God and that if we are not reconciled to Him, we will be punished by Him. But in His great grace, He has made a way so that sinners could be forgiven. And when the fear of the Lord, the gracious work of the Holy Spirit comes upon a person, It leads them to see that they need to be reconciled to God. And something needs to be done with their sins. And if grace has taught your heart to fear, then you also know that the same grace has relieved your fears by leading you to Jesus Christ to see where your sins can be forgiven. And ultimately, if you're a believer, have been paid for. Well, second we see here, still in verse 40, we see here the evidence of repentance. 
Now granted, it's the first fruit of repentance, but it's repentance nonetheless. The word repentance in the Greek, metanoeo, means a change of thinking. And scripturally, we see that such a change of thinking results in a change of behavior. You could reference Luke chapter 3, verses 10 through 14 for a few examples of that. This man had that. His way of thinking was changed. He went from not fearing God to fearing God. He went from blaspheming Christ to challenging the person who was blaspheming Christ. And we're going to see he went from mocking Jesus to placing his hope for eternity upon Jesus. This man experienced the first fruits of repentance and his change of thinking was so real. Note this, if you have a change of thinking that's real, at some level it's going to manifest itself publicly. It's not going to be like, hey, I became a Christian and all the people around me, nobody in the world even knows it. No, this man had the first fruits of repentance and already it's becoming public. Do you not fear God? And he's going to say more than that, but he's already challenging his previous philosophical and theological assumptions. Amazing. Evidence of fear, evidence of repentance, and there's more evidence to come. We continue in verse 41 where we read, he continues, And we indeed justly... For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And here's more evidence of this man's conversion. So third, in keeping with the previous two points in verse 40, we see that this man did not try to excuse himself. He didn't say, well, you know, this isn't really my fault. This is really just a product of my upbringing. That's really what it was. He didn't say, listen, I had to do what I did. And I'd do it again if I had the opportunity. He didn't say that. He didn't say it was the other guy's fault. He led me into thievery. No, speaking of his condemnation and their condemnation, he says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. He saw himself as a guilty sinner, saw himself as a criminal, who was getting what he deserved, and he affirmed the appropriateness of the judgment that he was experiencing. But then, contrasting that, so this is fourth, fourth evidence of this man's conversion. He saw Jesus as guiltless. And you have to love this about the crucifixion accounts. When you compile them, you see that person after person is attesting to Jesus' guiltlessness, Jesus' innocence. Right? Judas had said, Matthew 27, verse 4, I have betrayed innocent blood. Three times Pilate had said, in Matthew 23, we saw it, he said, I find no fault in this man. He affirmed in Luke 23, verse 15, and neither has Herod. We remember that Pilate's wife told Pilate, have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. And now this penitent thief joins the chorus of proclaiming Jesus' innocence. This man has done nothing wrong. That's a big, broad statement. And oh, how right he was. I don't know if he knew how right he was in that moment, but he was more right than perhaps he even knew. This man indeed did nothing wrong. Yes, it is as though he was saying, Jesus is not like us. We are guilty. He is innocent. But think also of what Jesus had been charged with. We saw it in Luke 23, 38 at least in some of the later manuscripts as communicated in the New King James Bible. We saw that there was an inscription over Jesus' head that says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So Jesus had been accused of basically insurrection would be the Roman charge, but the impetus for them to even bring that was the charge of blasphemy according to the Jewish Sanhedrin. And it's as though this thief is saying, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's not an insurrectionist. And you guys are challenging him, saying, if you are the Christ, if you are the Chosen One, if you are the Son of God, and he hasn't done anything wrong either. He is those things. He hasn't lied about it. I think that's an implication here. By saying that he was the Christ, by saying that he was the Son of God, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's telling the truth. He is who he said he was. Now we can see that this indeed was what this man believed. You see that in verse 42 where we read, Then he said to Jesus, Lord, some manuscripts say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
Now, fifthly, before we consider his profession of faith, let's see this man's requesting of forgiveness. I'd argue that's the fifth evidence that can be seen here. His requesting of forgiveness. Now, it's not explicit. He doesn't say, Jesus, forgive me. But given the fact that he had just been blaspheming Jesus not too long before, and yet now was asking Jesus to remember him, suggests to me that there was at least an implicit request for mercy. You know me, the guy who was just blaspheming you? Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So it's not overt, but I would suggest it is implicit. He offered no recitation of supposedly meritorious works. He didn't start saying, you know, when I was a kid, I used to help my parents. I cleaned my room a lot. You know, before I stole from that person in Nazareth, I actually helped an old lady across the street. He didn't try to give a supposedly meritorious list of works. He offered no suggestion that he could pay the price of admission to get into the kingdom. He simply requested grace. Jesus, remember me? Any implicit question there is, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Sixthly, he voiced faith in Jesus' lordship. Now, as I've already said, some of the older manuscripts read, Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom, as opposed to, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But even those earlier manuscripts suggest the same thing, that he believed in Jesus' lordship. He believed that his continued post-death existence hinged upon the sovereign determination of this one whom he hung next to. That is a trust in the lordship of Jesus. He doesn't ask Jesus to put in a good word for him and say, hey, when you see the big guy upstairs, will you put in a good word for me? Nothing like that. He knows that Jesus has the authority and he has the power to be the one who remembers him and thereby grants him entrance into the kingdom. And this is a biblical posture to take. Luke chapter 10 verse 22 agrees with this kind of thinking. There Jesus says, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. The idea being, the thief was right to believe that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, had the authority and the ability to confer salvation to whomever He will. And this criminal apparently believed that Jesus was King. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So even while others were mocking his kingship, we saw that earlier in Luke 23. If you are the king of the Jews, if you are the king of the Jews, this man in the midst of the mocking confesses his faith in Jesus' lordship. He knew a day was coming when Jesus would come into his kingdom or to use language from Young's literal translation, Remember me, Lord, when thou mayest come in thy reign. The pulpit commentary suggests this, quote, The penitent looked forward to the dying Jesus coming again in, arrayed in, his kingly dignity, surrounded with his power and glory, despite the fact that Jesus did not look very kingly, at least by human standards, this thief recognized Jesus' kingship and lordship. Now, I do think there's one more evidence that can be brought out here. I don't think we should overlook this. This penitent thief was willing to endure scorn and ridicule at least for the remainder of his life. Now we don't know if his family or friends were there at the foot of the cross. We don't know anything about that. Maybe he was the only one there. Maybe he had no family or friends. We don't know. We do know that he went against the grain of the crowd that was blaspheming Jesus. So either possibly he might have professed faith in front of his perceivably Jewish family in a crucified Messiah who was next to him, which wouldn't do much for his family legacy. Or he just went against the grain of the blasphemers and the mockers who were there, and he would thereby potentially subject himself to blasphemy and mocking. He wasn't afraid to be mocked for his identification with Jesus. And so he gives us yet another evidence of his salvation. 
He wasn't afraid to confess Jesus before men. And Jesus wouldn't not confess this man before his heavenly Father and the holy angels. Well, how did he know what he knew? It's a good question. How did he know what he knew about Jesus? Was he familiar with Jesus' ministry? Was that part of it? Did he know that Jesus ate with and reached out to tax collectors and sinners? Was all that he knew of Jesus, what he saw on the road to Calvary and at the cross, when he saw Jesus speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem, or when he saw Jesus pray, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing? Was it Pilate's, if you will, gospel trap that hung over the head of Jesus? This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Did the Holy Spirit beget saving faith as that thief perhaps kept looking at that? We don't know. But what we do know is this, that just like Lydia in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, whom the Lord opened her heart to heed and hear and believe the things that were spoken of by Paul, so the Holy Spirit of God opened this man's heart to believe who Jesus was based upon what he had heard at least at some point and what he had saw. Well, he confessed his faith in Jesus. He humbly sought mercy. He did not seek a position at Jesus' right hand or at Jesus' left hand. He just wanted to be remembered. And Jesus would do far better for this man than the chief butler did for Joseph. Verse 43 says, And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now one can only imagine what these words meant to the dying thief that was on the cross next to Jesus. Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you. Now that word translated assuredly in the Greek, Amen. Jesus uses it to accent things sometimes. Sometimes it's translated as verily, verily, Amen, Amen, or truly, truly. It's Jesus' way of accenting things. He, all His words are precious. All His words are truth. But it's as though sometimes He wants to call our attention to something, especially if, he, if it's against the backdrop of something that's potentially more, if you will, hard to believe. Assuredly, I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. Jesus wanted this criminal to know, not just to hope, he wanted him to know, assuredly, you will be with me. Not in some distant future. Today, you will be with me. Here, there's no talk of purgatory. There's no talk of a waiting room. An unbiblical concept in itself. This man was not disqualified because he was not baptized. This man demonstrated the first fruits of repentance. And he demonstrated the faith alone that saves this man is a reminder that salvation really is by grace, through faith, alone. As J.C. Ryle wrote, Do we want proof that salvation is of grace and not of works? We have it in the case before us. The dying thief was nailed hand and foot to the cross. He could do literally nothing for his own soul. Yet even he, through Christ's infinite grace, was saved. No one ever received such a strong assurance of his own forgiveness as this man. He later goes on and he says, He lives who saved the penitent thief. There is hope for the vilest sinner if he will only repent and believe. Salvation, hear it, know it. We preach that the gospel is this, that Christ died for sinners, that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. After having lived a perfect life, He bore the wrath that was deserved of all who would believe on Him for the forgiveness of sins. And when you come to Him, and when you simply profess true, genuine, saving faith, which is coterminous with repentance, a change of thinking that inevitably will result in a change of behavior, you are justified, you are saved by grace through faith alone. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, lest any man should boast. What about good works? Well, we are God's worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand for us to walk in, for us to do. But you are not saved by those good works. 
Those works are the outworking of your salvation. So sinner, if you have not come to the cross, join sinners who have. And see how great is the grace that cleanses from all sin. And just as we had alluded to, Jesus was not just going to remember this thief. He was going to be with him. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, the Scripture does not provide us with a load of details concerning the intermediate state, what it's like for a believer who dies in Jesus before the resurrection of their bodies. We don't have a lot of details concerning the intermediate state, but here, for example, Jesus used the word paradise, the Greek word paradison, Now, according to Help's word studies, this word is, quote, an ancient Persian word meaning enclosure, garden, or park. That's why you can see in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this word is used to describe the Garden of Eden. Now, this word paradison is used three times in the New Testament. Here is one of them. The other two times it is used is in 2 Corinthians and is in the book of Revelation. In 2 Corinthians 12, 4, Paul said that he was, quote, caught up into paradise. And he heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul there, speaking about heaven, the dwelling place of God. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, Jesus told the church at Ephesus that the one who overcomes will, quote, eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And there he appears to be referencing the paradise depicted as being found in the new Jerusalem. You can look ahead to Revelation 22, verse 2, and you can see that same tree described being there in the new Jerusalem. And here, on that very day, Jesus was telling that converted thief that he was going to be in a glorious place that Jesus identified as paradise. I love that. It's a real place. You can't find it on a map, or you can't find it on any globe, no matter how many times you spin it around. But it's just as real as any place you can find on a map, as long as the map is legitimate. And any place that you could find on a globe, that's how real it is. Today, you're going to be with me here, at this location, in this place, in paradise. You will be with me. And as beautiful as the aesthetics of paradise are, and I'm sure they far exceed my best conceptions of it, what makes paradise truly paradise is not, at the end of the day, the aesthetics. It is who is there. That's why when Paul spoke about leaving this body, he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8 In Philippians 1.23, he said that to to depart and to be with Christ is far better than now. What makes paradise paradise is not the aesthetics, as beautiful as those aesthetics are. But ultimately, what makes paradise paradise is who is there. Jesus. Let me just illustrate this for you briefly by way of referencing, for example, my honeymoon. When Lauren and I had our honeymoon, we went to many nice places, beautiful places. We've gone on some nice trips since then, but perhaps the most visually stunning places that we went to, it was on our honeymoon. But if you take Lauren out of the equation of the honeymoon, and I'm just walking around those beautiful places, those beautiful places aren't as attractive to me regardless of how beautiful they are. Because really what made the honeymoon the honeymoon was not, oh, this scenery is great. Like, I don't care if you're here. I just want this scenery. What made the honeymoon the honeymoon was Lauren and enjoying the scenery with Lauren. It's the same idea when it comes to heaven. What makes it so great? Yes, it's going to be beautiful far beyond your conceptions. Paradise is just the tip of the iceberg the way it could be described. But what makes it what it is is who is there. And not just saints and not just angels, but Jesus Christ. The Word that we've been studying. The One that we know. The amazing thing about when you see Jesus, there's going to be a sense in which I know you. Because His Spirit abides in you and you've been spending time learning His Word. He's the Word incarnate. So you're going to know that you have known Him. 
probably better than you even think because you've been studying his word and his spirit dwells in you and that's what makes heaven heaven that's what makes paradise paradise who is there even more beatific than the aesthetics will be the presence of the bridegroom Jesus Christ let our hearts long for that moment to see him long for that day now, having said what we have said about verse 43 and about this passage, there remains an apologetic application, a precious principle, and an invitation we must not spurn. We'll begin with the apologetic application, which is essentially an apologetic against the erroneous doctrine of soul sleep. Now, soul sleep is the doctrine that teaches that those who die are essentially unconscious till the resurrection. People look at terms in the New Testament like saying those who have fallen asleep or when Jesus said Lazarus has fallen asleep. But we can see how the New Testament uses that as a euphemism for death. To fall asleep is often used as a euphemism to describe death. And this is a passage that teaches against and refutes and rebuts the erroneous doctrine of soul sleep. The New Testament clearly teaches that even though a believer will be separated from his body for a time until the resurrection that he will nonetheless continue in conscious existence. That's why Jesus could say to the thief on the cross who is next to him, one of them, you will be with me this day in paradise. Their bodies would be on earth, Jesus's would be buried, and presumably something would be done with the thief as well, but their bodies would be there, but they would continue in conscious existence and fellowship. So we saw in those verses, the Apostle Paul saying that for him to die in the intermediate state before the resurrection was to be with Christ, not just to fall asleep and wait for the day to be with Christ, but to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. The martyred saints in heaven are depicted not as sleeping, but as asking, how long, O Lord? holy and true, until you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And not depicted as taking a nap and snoring. They're depicted as longing for holy justice. Now to that end, in Jesus' teaching on Luke 16, which we spent two weeks on, Lazarus, Abraham, and the rich man are all depicted there as being awake and conscious while in the intermediate state. But a little bit more of apologetic preparation. People who would hold to this, even some Jehovah's Witnesses who ascribe to the doctrine of annihilationism, saying that after a person dies, if they have not repented of their sins, they're ultimately annihilated, they will reference a verse like this, or pretty much this verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. It reads like this. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Now, as we've talked about many times before, it's a dangerous thing to take verses from Ecclesiastes, which is in essence a critique of life lived under the sun, to take verses out of its ecclesiastical context and say, that is a verse that is teaching doctrine or a verse that is what I'm going to build my life upon. For example... Ecclesiastes 10.19 reads like this. Take this verse out of context and just read it. A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. And you take that verse out of context, and somebody can look at that and say, there you have it. I've been looking for the answer to life on earth. There it is. Money answers everything. I have to get more money. Because money answers everything. Not realizing that vanity of vanity, says the preacher. He's showing you how vain life lived under the sun is. Under the sun, it looks like when the dead are dead, it looks like they know nothing. It looks like they have no reward. They just go into the ground. It looks like this side of earth, that money does answer everything. That's the idea of Ecclesiastes. It's critiquing life lived under the sun versus a life lived under heaven. So dare not use Ecclesiastes 9.5 to make a doctrine for soul sleep or annihilationism when it's just critiquing the way people view life under the sun. Money doesn't answer everything and the dead do not know nothing even though it looks that way under the sun. Believers are said to be present with the Lord and unbelievers are depicted 
as being in a place of judgment before the final sentencing of the white throne judgment. Well, then there's a principle that we shouldn't miss. A principle we shouldn't miss. Jesus wants his people to have an assurance of salvation. Jesus does not want you, if you are a son or daughter of God, he does not want you wondering every week whether or not you are a Christian. Now, Jesus does not want the worldling who is given to the desires of the flesh, has no love for the body of Christ, does not live and walk after the path of God's commandments. Jesus does not want such a person to have an assurance of salvation. They should not have an assurance of salvation. And yes, 1 John does give us ways in which we can make our calling and election sure, to use language from 2 Peter, that if we keep His commandments, we can know that we have everlasting life, we can know that we actually have saving faith. If we love the brethren, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. But at the end of the day, Jesus wants you not to forever be spending your time wondering whether or not you are saved. He wants you to know and have an assurance of salvation that you are saved. That's the point of the tests in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, John writes this, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. So yes, make your calling and election sure. Yes, examine yourself to see whether or not in your faith you will have to do those periodic checkups. But your life should not just be one where you have no assurance of faith because you're always putting yourself under the ringer. You should have an assurance of faith and occasionally do, or perpetually do in some measure, diagnostic checks. I can assure you, if I want my son Zachary to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I love him, and I want him to be confident of that. By God's grace, I want to remind him of that every day, that Dad loves you, Dad cares about you. And I want him to know that that love is steadfast. Whether he has a good day or a bad day, a great day or a not so great day, I want him to know, I love you. How much more does our Heavenly Father, who sent His Son to the cross, want the people that He bought with the blood of His Son to know, I loved you, I love you. And my affection towards you is not on and off. It's not wavering. It's fixed and it's steadfast and it's based upon what Jesus did at Calvary. Jesus didn't leave the penitent thief hanging and wondering. He assured him that his future was secure. Well, lastly, there's an invitation we must not spurn. Perhaps the worst takeaway that you can have from a message like this would be, wow, this is great. So I could live my whole life in rebellion against God, and then at the end of my life, I too can have a deathbed conversion like the penitent thief. Perhaps the worst takeaway that you could have from a message like this. For starters, there is no guarantee that you'll even have a deathbed. You don't know when your life is going to end. You don't know when your heart's going to stop beating. You don't know whether it's going to be sudden or you don't know whether you're going to have an extended time on a deathbed. The conclusion of your life can come suddenly and without warning. You should not presume and think, this thief tells me, I do not have to be in a hurry to get things right with God and receive Christ. No. In fact, the other thief, as it were, he tells you that you need to be in a hurry. And that you need to turn to God in repentance and faith because you cannot turn repentance and faith on and off. You can't do it. The other thief on the cross, he couldn't do it. He couldn't just say, you know what? I'm going to turn on repentance and faith right now. Can't do it. His mind was so fixed that he believed a certain philosophical presupposition about who Jesus was and that's what he went with and he couldn't shake it. It's kind of like that man I told you about in the hospital. I've spent my whole life not believing in Jesus. What makes you think I'm going to turn to him now? Beware how a conscience can become increasingly seared. Be aware how a heart can become increasingly hard. And recognize that today is the day of salvation. And if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Recognize that you need to put faith in Christ now. Because Jesus said to the thief on the cross, one of them, today you will be with me in paradise. But notice, He did not say that to both of them. That other man was not going to be with Jesus in paradise. As depicted earlier in Luke's Gospel, it would appear that he was going to be in a place of torment 
awaiting the sentencing that would come post the resurrection of his body at the great white throne judgment as depicted in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 14. He's a reminder to you that you need to place saving faith in Jesus today. Therefore, be careful that you do not spurn the outreached arms of God's grace. Be careful that you do not see this passage as an excuse to repent tomorrow when you have no assurance that tomorrow will even come. If you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Grip, as it were, His outstretched hand by doing what the thief did. By the grace of God, repent of your sinful behaviors and thinking. I've been wrong about you, Jesus. I've been wrong about my life, and I repent of my sinful ways and my thinking. See yourself as guilty and deserving of judgment. Say, we indeed justly... You can use some other language. We're called sinners, justly, deserving of condemnation. See Jesus as both innocent and as who He said He is. See Him as the spotless Lamb who, because He was spotless, could bear all your spots to make you spotless. See Him as who He is, the Son of God and the Messiah. See who Jesus is and ask Him on the basis of His death and resurrection for forgiveness and mercy. You could say, if you will, remember me, Jesus. Remember me. Because I trust you. And I believe you died for my sins and you rose from the grave for my justification. Or thank you that you have remembered me, if you will, by bringing me to yourself so that I do believe that. And finally, I would encourage you this. If that is you, make your faith public. It's not just a private thing. Somebody has to know about it. I'm going to say some bodies have to know about it. If you do have true saving faith, it will be public. And do not be afraid to challenge the lies around you concerning Jesus, concerning the forgiveness of sins, concerning salvation. And if the Spirit does beget such faith and repentance in you, you can be assured that the words that Jesus spoke to the penitent thief, likely minus the words today, (laughs) are true for you that you will be with Jesus in paradise. And He wants you, son or daughter of God, who has repented and placed faith in Him, to know that. To know that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this narrative. We thank You for all the instruction that we could receive from it. We thank You, Heavenly Father, for the witness of divine grace as seen in this passage. We thank You, Heavenly Father, for the graciousness of Your Son and how willing He is to receive sinners. That He would receive a man who was blaspheming Him moments earlier. Father, I pray if there'd be anybody who would be hearing this message or in this building who has blasphemed You perhaps even moments earlier, I pray that they would be astounded by such grace that such a strong Savior would be willing to receive even the, even the most vilest of sinners like us. So Father, I pray as You see fit that You would draw men to Your Son. Cause us, Lord, to treasure what we have and to know that there is a paradise and a place in which Christ is right now and a place where ultimately all believers will be. We love You, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.